only things that I've added to gem command is lazy, lazy loading. So when you start up uh, gem, it doesn't have to load up everything until you go and say gem install, then it'll load the install class for you. Uh, gem command also gives you uh, argument grouping. So for the help output, you can say, well, these all, all these commands, or all these arguments are for, for local and remote, all these arguments are for version, etc. And there's also some argument helpers. So you can say, uh, get one gem name, get one optional argument, get all gem names, and then it'll also go ahead and raise the appropriate errors for you. So you don't have to redo that across multiple classes. It also provides argument sharing by modules. So we've got a module for local and remote options, one for install and update options, and one for uh, version of platform options. And you can also um, only, for some of these, you can only include the ones you want. And finally, there's uh, integrated help. So gem help will list all the commands that you can use that are, that are active in Ruby gems. And I think the niftiest feature is um, command completion. So since uh, there's only one command that starts with i, you can type gem i to install gems instead of gem install. Now I'll review some uh, important, important uh, components in Ruby gems that have changed. Uh, first up is the gem format. Originally, the format was uh, was YAML, YAML-based. So the beginning was a, a Ruby self-install header, followed by a YAML gem spec, and then a YAML manifest, which lists all the files and their, their sizes and their um, file modes. And then after that was the, uh, the file data. So there was one file separated by dashes, and they were basically four encoded and uh, compressed. And so these original gems, you can't uh, install them by running the gem anymore like you used to be able to because the gem installer interface has changed. Uh, the custom format was replaced with this targ zip format, which was a little bit more flexible and uses more standard tools. So in the new format, um, a gem is a tar file, and inside that tar file is a data targ which contains all the files, and a general gem spec in the metadata.gz. And when we added sign gems, it was really easy to go and extend this by just adding a signature for each of those files. Um, how Ruby Gems integrates itself with Ruby has probably changed the most in Ruby Gems. Originally, you would use required gem. So when you get required gem of, of some file, you would add all the gems paths to the Ruby's load path. And then there, if you had an auto require listed in your gem spec, it would automatically require that file for you. And this, wasn't, this didn't work like required because it's nicer to have just be able to require stuff and have it be loaded regardless of whether it's a built-in or it's proper Ruby gems. So <coughs> library stubs were added. And with the library stub, um, if you had an auto require in your gem, Ruby gems would install a, a stub for this auto require, which would, when you required it, would do a required gem first. And then it would uh, activate your gem, and then it would require the original file again now that it was added to your load path. And this, this still didn't, this had some problems. Um, there was, you could only have uh, one file, or, or one active version. Um, and there were problems with, uh, if you had multiple files having the same, or multiple gems having the same file, there, was, there would be, could be conflicts there. So custom require replaced this. And uh, custom require overrides kernel require. First it does a real require, and goes through the whole load path. The gem isn't there, it rescues the exception and activates a gem that has that file and then runs through the same process again. And now in, uh, in Ruby 1.9, Ruby Gems is just built in, so we don't have to do require Ruby Gems before requiring a file. So this is much more, much more natural. Um, the evolution of the remote index was uh, long and painful, and um, some of you have been using Ruby Gems for a while, surely remember the uh, updating bulk index uh, pain. Um, so originally, the Ruby Gems used one big YAML file. And that had every gem spec for every gem with every detail, including the file list, all the files that were in the gem. And this was fine because there weren't many gems way back in those days. But, but over time, Ruby Gems became more popular, and so that file got bigger and bigger, and eventually it got too big. And uh, in order to install a gem, you'd need to download this huge file to update your local cache. So incremental updates were added. And with incremental updates, Ruby Gems would fetch individual YAML files to update the local cache. So in theory, you'd have to download a few small files instead of a big file and updating the index. Um, so this, this didn't, this still took a long time. So the format was switched to Marshall, and that helped a little bit because the 
files were a little smaller and persistent connections were added and that helped a little bit because you didn't have to go and make a round trip to the server every time. But it still wasn't enough. File, the one file was still too big because on the client side, you still have to load this giant file up to figure out what all the dependencies were to, make, to install the jam. So for uh, small virtual servers, a 128 megabyte virtual server was pretty popular back then. <coughs> Um, this would bring the gem server, or bring the, uh, the virtual server to its knees, because it would take more than 128 megabytes just to install the gem. So I replaced that with the modern index. The, the mo monolithic cache file was too big, and RubyGems needed to instead download only the files it needed, and then load just the gem specs it needed on demand. So this would reduce, vastly reduce its, uh, its memory footprint. So now with modern index, when you type gem install, you download this latest specs file, and it contains the name and the version of the platform wall, the latest versions of every gem. And then once it's got that, it can go and, and download that gem spec, figure out the dependencies, and then continue to download the gem specs just for the dependencies it's need, it needs. And this, uh, this latest specs file is about 150 kilobytes, and can be made even smaller with some Marshall tricks. Um, if you provide a, a version, it downloads this specs file, which is just a little bit bigger, um, and the rest of the process is the same as for uh, uh, an install without the version. So to recap, um, basically the problem with the index was a scaling problem. Now originally we had this YAML file, that was one big YAML file that was cached locally. That got too big and too hard to update, so we added the quick index and then gem spec for every gem. That was too slow to download, so we added the, the Marshall file, Marshall file, which was smaller, and the Marshall version gem specs, which were smaller to reduce the number of, of downloads, and also added persistent connections. And then finally replaced that with the two specs file, one for the latest gems and one for all the gems, and then a, a cache file per gem. And the on-disk format is also now one cache file per remote file. So you only have to down, upload, or you only have to load one file at a time. Oh. So Fire Brigade drove my first major commitment to RubyGems, which was the gem installer. I wanted to, to have a tool that would go and download every gem, install it into a clean environment, and then run the tests on that gem, and then make a, a report that to a website. And so in order to do this, I needed a, a way to automatically install, install all these gems in a sandbox. So this was too hard with the original installer. Um, when I started, there were these two classes, the, the gem installer and the gem remote installer. The gem installer did the um, extracting the gem file, uh, put all the files in the right place, build the extensions, and install any executable steps you need. The remote installer would go and download the gem, figure out if there were any dependencies, ask the user, hey, do you want to install this dependency? And it would install the dependency, and then finally it would install the gem. And the problem with this was it wasn't, wasn't automatic enough. There was too much work for me to uh, get the gem installed. You know, asking, asking me if I wanted to, I always wanted to install the dependencies. Um, it, also, it also could, uh, could sometimes reinstall a dependency multiple times. So if you had a gem that had a dependency on rake, and then another dependency before it also had a dependency on rake, a rake could get installed multiple times because it wouldn't recheck, it wouldn't make a full dependency map first. When I finished, there were two installer classes, the gem installer and the gem dependency installer. But the gem dependency installer worked a little bit different. First, it would go and resolve all of the dependencies, and then install all of the gems once it figured out what the entire map was. Also, the API was a little bit nicer with the way it interacted with the cache. Um, platforms in RubyGems are, are a way for RubyGems to deal with having alternate gems for people who don't have compilers. A platform works pretty similar to a version. <coughs> so um, x86 Darwin 10 maps to 32-bit Ruby on OS 10, 10.6. Uh, Universal Darwin 10 maps to any architecture that 10.6 supports. And Universal Darwin maps to any architecture, any version of, of OS 10. And so you can, you can build a gem version this way to make it similar to a gem version. Or sorry, build a platform this way to make it similar to a gem version. And so um, when you're building with platforms, the best thing to do is use uh, Luis Lavena's rate compiler. 
This will go ahead and build the gem that can work in both 1.8 and 1.9 all in one package. Um, if you're too lazy to set up gem or set up rate compiler, you should use the current version constant. Um, and if you're too lazy to go and build for both 1.8 and 1.9, you should set the required Ruby version to prevent it from installing on the version that you have to compile for. Uh, platforms is still not, not a perfect solution. There's still some, some problems with uh, RubyGems prefers gems matching the platform, but many gems are 1.8 only. Many existing platform gems are 1.8 only. So if you go to try and use this on 1.9, like a lot of Windows people try, then the gem just installs, but it doesn't actually work. Um, the other problem is uh, Ruby will, Ruby gems will fall back to the Ruby platform, which may involve um, building, ex building an extension. This is a problem when the person who builds the platform jam is different from the main author. So if the platform or if the, the version, if the main version is updated, that goes and hides all the platform versions until uh, new releases are made for the, for, for example, for Windows. So there, there's still several things that I'd, I'd like to fix in Ruby Gems that I think could be better. Um, first one is is Gem Mirror. It's certainly an important bit of code, but not many people use it. it hasn't been actually worked on in years. Uh, it's slow and it's bandwidth intensive in order to to update the gems. Instead, you should use uh, Ruby Gems Mirror by James Tucker. Uh, James Tucker's Ruby Gems Mirror uses persistent connections to uh, speed up the gem, gem downloads. It also provides parallel fetching, parallel fetching, so you can download multiple gems at once, and uses the modern index rather than the old um, Marshall index. There's also Gem, gem Test, which is also runnable by Gem Install T. Um, I don't think actually does anybody has anybody used Gem Install or Gem Test? No. You, <laughs> you have used it. Yeah, I, I don't think this actually works any. It, it doesn't actually work very well anymore. Um, one of the problems is now in Ruby we've got a uh, half dozen popular testing frameworks. So, and there's no consistent API across these to go and figure out, hey, how do we run these tests? Do we run them successfully? Um, it's just not. It's not something that's easy to go and do in Ruby Gems. So, um, Eric Lensby is working on Ruby Gems test. And so one of the things, one of the other things that Ruby Gem, uh, that the Gem test command doesn't do is install the development dependencies. Uh, Ruby Gem's test goes ahead and goes ahead and takes care of this for you and uses Ray test. Um, it's still in development, so if you want to help out with this, you can go talk to Eric H on the IRC channel. Um, and uh, fancy require is a is a feature that I like that I've that I've developed um, with with the inspiration of Nobu to add a lookup object to Ruby's load path. So uh, Ruby Gems would add a Ruby Gems lookup object to the load path, and this would respond to the path for method. And so you would pass it the name of a file that, or, or Ruby would pass it the name of a file that's going to be required, and then it would respond with one of three things. Uh, a file path telling Ruby to go and, and load this file like normal, or it could respond with true false to say, hey, it's, the load has already been taken care of and this was the status, or it could return nil saying to go on to the next item in the load path. And so with this, Ruby Gems could be encapsulated, the Ruby Gems um, custom require could be encapsulated in this lookup object rather than sitting on top of require, which would reduce the, um, the memory footprint in, in Ruby 1.9. Um, I'd also like the gem spec to be more strict about what it allows. Uh, Jeremy Hindergartner is going to be talking in two talks, and he's going to have all the gory details of that. Uh, but basically, there's a lot of junk in the gem specs. Uh, just over time, because it's a, a Ruby format, you can pretty much add almost anything in Ruby to the gem spec, and, and previously Ruby gems just didn't care. So it would be nice to have some better, cleaner uh, metadata. Unfortunately, I don't know what the solution to this is, because it's hard to go and say, oh, you can't add that, but still support the old gems that had stuff that I'd like to avoid. So now on to RDoc. So RDoc was originally written by Dave Thomas. And Dave Thomas wanted a, a set of tools to create documentation in the source for Ruby and for Ruby projects. And so I think he's, I think he's uh, absolutely succeeded with this, because there are uh, pretty much every project has at least some documentation in the RDoc format. But when I asked him about this, um, as I was researching my, my talk, he said, I am surprised and terrified that RDoc lasted as long as it did. 
So um, my first contribution to RDoC was a uh, RI output formatter for an IRC bot. See, uh, for an IRC bot, so you can go and look up RI data with an IRC bot. And then I also added gem RI paths so that the RI tool can also look up um, gem RI or RI data for gems. So, like Ruby gems, I'll make a rundown of the the RDoC releases. So RDoC 101 was added to Ruby 181, and much of the development of the original version of RDoC was done in Ruby trunk without, or uh, the 18 branch without any separate release notes. Uh, when I took over RDoC releases, I bumped the version to two. Version two, I replaced the template page templating with ERB and uh, moved everything into the RDoC namespace. Also, I added uh, Ryan Davis's RI cache to speed up lookup of RI methods. In RDoC 2.1, I added support for metaprogram methods like adder accessor. So those would be, um, you can document those and, and have them display in RI or, or uh, the HTML output. I also added ancestor lookup to RI. So if you, if you looked up uh, file read, it would display IO read. But I don't think that exact example would work because there was another bug in RDoC that would make um, file be a subclass of IO. In RDoC 2.2, we improved the, uh, improved the RI cache and added interactive RI. In 2.3, we switched to Michael Granger's dark finish generator uh, and added some RDoC generator speedups such as uh, threading and added RDoC discover to plug it to, to uh, RDoC discover to, add, to look up additional generators or templates. RDoC 2.4 removed the HTML generator, HTML, original HTML generator and the XML generator because I didn't need two HTML generators to maintain and nobody used the XML generator. And finally, RDoC 2.5 added a new RI data format and removed the threading because there were problems with visibility across multiple classes when threading was used. So some, some components of RDoC. Uh, first up, the parsers. So the parser goes in converts the code into a tree of, of objects representing the project. Uh, the Ruby parser is based on IRB and walks token stream. The C parser is based on regular expressions and just kind of drafts around in the file looking for pieces of, pieces of information. The tree that the parser builds is, RDoC, is, based on, or is composed of RDoC code objects. And there's a subclass per Ruby construct. So there's one for classes and one for modules, methods, attributes. Uh, files, constants, and require and include. I think those are all of them. And then so the parser goes and constructs a graph of these objects. So a file will contain a class, and that class contains methods, and then the method will go and link back to the file where it was defined. And the generators go and take this code object and turn it in code, ob code object graph and turn it into some kind of output. So uh, RDoC generates HTML using Darkfish, generates RI data. And I also have a, a work in progress generator for tags file format for use in an underlying bin. There's also an old uh, Microsoft CHM generator which is still floating around out there, but I'm not sure if it works anymore. RDoC markup provides the uh, block and importing, blocked and inline formatting using a plain text format. And for fancier formatting, you can embed HTML if you wanted to add a table. And finally, RI is RDoC's command line documentation tool. So it outputs uh, for several formats, including plain text, uh, ANSI colorized text, and you can also get HTML out of it. So I think the, the best feature in RDoC is the code object tree. So the parcels built this graph of RDoC code objects, which uh, represent the entire project. So the various classes involved in here can uh, provide full introspection, so the generators can more easily generate documentation. You can also use this intermediate data stores. You can manipulate it into a new format, like for the HTML generator or for the text file output. The code object tree provides rich interaction. So for example, methods and attributes are sortable, and they're separate classes, but they're all sortable with each other. Um, it's easy to create uh, new scenarios when building tests for some higher order behaviors. And there's also a pretty print baked in so that when I'm writing some tests and I want to make some new thing, if it fails, it'll go and, and show me a pretty output that I can go and actually look at and figure out what's, what's going on instead of just an inspect output, which is 
kind of hard to read. So in, in RDoC, I replaced more code than RubyGems, which is largely factor, for factoring. Uh, first up is RDoC markup. The original RDoC markup used a regex parser for text blocks. So you had uh, blocks for paragraphs and lists and verbatim sections. And then the inline markup for things like emphasis or cross references was separate. Um, and the original markup used, or the original parser used regular expressions to go and figure out um, stuff like indented uh, blocks like the slide here. And so the state was kept separate from the regular expression, which was a little bit hard for me to maintain and follow. So I replaced this with a, a tokenizer and a cursor descent parser. And so it used, so it parses the, the input text and builds a markup tree, and the, but the inline markup is still separate. And when I wrote this, I, I battle tested my new parser against all the gems using Gauntlet to make sure that I didn't have any, any bugs that I didn't know about from the tests. And then once you have a tree, you can use the visitor pattern to go and output the text. So uh, currently, the, the visitors involved in RDoC are um, RDoC text output, which is pretty much a mirror of the original. Uh, backspace text for page output, because most pagers don't support ANSI out of the box. Um, ANSI text for colorized output, HTML, and uh, an extra class for HTML with cross-reference links for, uh, for Darkfish. Um, like, the, like the gem index, the RI software from a success problem as well. Um, originally, there was just one RI data directory. And then with the gems, you added a RI data directory per gem. And for every method and class, there was a file for that documentation that was YAML. And so if you wanted to uh, look up some, some method with RI, it would go and look through all of, the, all of these data directories, try and get a walk, and static all the files, go and, and look up, hey, is there this method here? And then if uh, once Ancestor was looked up, it got worse, because then you'd have to go and look up the class for all those and then go and look up the method again. So you ended up doing a lot of file stats across a lot of the file system, which was really slow. There was also a separate formatter for output. So the, um, the HTML generators and the RI shared, or didn't share any of the code. For the first pass uh, at improving RI, it was largely done by Ryan Davis. Um, the YAML objects were replaced with, uh, with hashes. So Ruby, Ruby or sorry, RI would load up a YAML object originally, and now it just loaded a, a nested hash. Um, also, there's a cache of file locations added, but given the nature of the original RI code, this was a bit too difficult. Uh, for the second pass, the Marshall format was added. So we store the RDoC code objects directly, and also store the RDoC markup, uh, RDoC markup tree in there for the parse comment, and then also reuse the visitor code. There's also an index included to speed lookups, but it's not a complete ca uh, there's not a complete cache across all the gems like the original format. Um, none of the original RDoC generators remain. The XML and CHM generators have been removed from RDoC because they were unused and unmaintained. The CHM generator is still floating around if anybody wanted to, to resurrect it, though. Um, the original HTML generator used, used a class called template page generate output. This consumed a JSON-like hash, which was uh, very simple and used um, each and if were the only only looping or, or constructs or the only constructs in it. Would also convert the RDoC code object tree into a half nested hash, which was uh, which lost all the richness of the Ruby objects. It's also a memory hog. By later 1.8 releases, it would take about two, two gigabytes to go and generate all the HTML documentation. So to improve the HTML generator, first I added I switched to ERB to make template writing templates easier, but we still had this um, code object transformation. Um, and then Michael Granger came and wrote, uh, wrote Darkfish, Darkfish, which I converted to off the code object tree directly, meaning there was no extra tree to build, making it more memory friendly. Um, incidentally, one of Koichi's students, uh, Tetsu So, wrote a memory profiler that found the cause of the memory consumption in Apollo's original HTML generator. But this was after the, the Darkfish switch. Uh, the original RI, RI generator translated the code object tree into a separate tree of, of RI description objects, which were stored in YAML format. And so and there was also no index to, to speed up any lookups. 
URI uh, URI uses the code object tree with R doc markup content uh, comments and has an index per directory. So we can easily go and see what all the classes and methods and the ancestor chain for all the gems right off the bat, just instead of having to walk through a bunch of files. So there's still some things I'd like to change in R doc. Um, so this slide may look familiar. Uh, the Ruby parser is based on RV, which is rather hard to change. I added multi-byte support to it, and that was pretty difficult. Uh, I've also added features to the C parser, which were not very fun. And my experience with Hardock Markup and Ruby to Ruby tell me that Ruby to Ruby tell me that it's much easier to walk a syntax tree than to walk to, to interpret a token stream or to uh, drop around in a file. So I like to switch to something like Ripper and Cast. Um, also, encoding support is not actually done as done in but it's not actually released yet. Um, the, release RDoC is, the released versions assume a single encoding across all the files. So in the trunk, I transcode all, all the input documents to one output encoding that you specify. Um, I haven't battle tested this yet, which is why it's not been released. I'd like to go and make sure that I don't break any gems. Um, I have some plugin support in RDoC, but I don't think I have enough yet. Um, you, can do, you can add generators, you can add um, hook directed to do custom stuff, but I don't yet have a way of adding command line options to a generator. Um, and I'm sure that there's probably some plugins I should add to RI, but I'm not sure what they should be yet. So, uh, what have I learned from, from RubyGems and Arda? Um, the first thing is, to have a good project, you need a good API. And so, a good API has a clean separation of concerns. So, the, for example, the dependency installer um, should only, only is involved in, in figuring out what dependencies to install. And it, has the caching is separate and the uh, installing is separate from it. So your, your classes should all do one thing and they should do that one thing really well. There should be a rich interaction amongst your objects. So are you going to want to sort your objects? Well, then you should add spaceship. Oh, I got an error. Spaceship and comparable. Um, are you going to want to enumerate your objects? Provide each an enumerable, it's not comparable. And uh, are you going to use your objects as a hash key? Um, provide the hash and the EQLA method. Um, so refactor your methods aggressively, or refactor your classes aggressively. Make sure you shave off any rough edges and, and encapsulate any state that's shared across multiple objects down into one. This makes your API easier to use. Um, to get there, you're going to want to have good tests for everything. They help you refactor, and they also teach you about your pain points. If you're not sure how to go and find these out, build some other thing with your API that's not whatever your main thing is. Um, in this case, for the installers, it was Fire Brigade taught me about how difficult it was to actually use the installer classes. And then once you've done this, you can go back and refactor the original implementation. And then once your software is out there and it's successful, people will be using it in ways you don't expect. So if you can, go and battle test it. Um, you know, tests are good, but they're not gonna, they're only your ideas about how to use the code. They're not everybody else's ideas. So you can only make it so idiot proof. Um, for, for uh, RDoC and RubyGems, I can use Gauntlet, which can harvest the wisdom of many idiots. <laughs> when I replaced the RDoC markup parser, I ran Gauntlet and found uh, several crashing bugs and infinite loop bugs in my parser, even though I had all of Dave's original tests. And so in this case, I was the idiot, but since I was able to battle test, nobody noticed. Um, you know, Gauntlet has a narrow focus, though. It's only for gems. And it goes through, does this process, it downloads every latest gem, converts it to a charge easy, and then can run a command against every gem. So that's, um, you know, that's all it does. Uh, for, for example, at work at AT&T, we do a lot of <coughs> solar stuff. So in order to battle test our solar parsing code, I could write a tool that would do dictionary searches uh, against the solar server, and then go and, and run the, the results through our, uh, through our solar parsing code. So you may even have some success problems after a while. Um, and these can be hard to tackle, especially when you have only a few tests. Um, Hardock and RubyGems had some kind of poor had some poor code or some poor test coverage. So make sure you go and write more tests to go figure out how it works. Um, when there's many moving parts, it's gonna be kind of hard to figure out, hey, is it supposed to work this way? So tests can help you figure that out. And really, so what this is doing is helping you familiarize yourself with the code so you can test it. So once you've tested it, it'll tell you kind of, or give you an idea of why it works the way it does. So that you can learn how, once you've learned how it works, then you can make small improvements. And if those small improvements don't do it, then you can replace it completely. This is how I improved, how I improved uh, RI to RubyGems remote index. 
and you know, you know, be sure to examine the problem closely. You know, what, what do you really need to fix here? Um, will simple improvement do it? Will simple, simpler code do it? If, if none of those things will work, then finally replace it. Do that. Try that last. Uh, replacing it first means you might not replace it with a good enough thing. And finally, less is more. Having less in your project is much better. Um, when there's less, less code in your project, uh, it's easier to coordinate amongst busy developers. Um, so, with, with plugins, so for that, uh, Rdoc and RubyGems both provide plugins, which make it easier for many people to work on what they want to work on, rather than having me maintain everything. Um, plugins give you more flexibility. So, um, if, if James Tucker wants to make a release of RubyGems Mirror, or Eric Lensby wants to make a new release of RubyGems Test, they don't have to worry about me making some feature, some unrelated feature in RubyGems work. They can just go and do it. And uh, with this, more ideas can be explored. For example, uh, there's RubyGem Sing, which will sing the, the indentation of your code. Or uh, uh, there's, there's, you know, Gem Cutter was, was originally started out as a plugin. And so this, you know, this in, in, ends up with less forking of your original code base because everybody can work on their own little happy thing. Um, but plugins can be hard to do right, so be very careful when you start. Um, think carefully about when, you're gonna, when, when you should load the plugins and what to hook. In RubyGems, I've made, made a mistake with the way the plugins work because they're loaded all the time. So even when you're not going to use a, a command plugin, hey, they're getting loaded up. Also, uh, be careful about API locking. Um, if you do it wrong, then you might get stuck supporting something you don't want to. Uh, thank you. That's the end. Any questions? So I recently had occasion to need all of the gem quick specs in advance for my own mirror. And RubyGems mirror doesn't do that. So I wrote a thing that does it. But in order to do it, I needed the deflated Marshall index that I think is going away over time. To my understanding, that's the only place you can go and say, what are all the versions of all the gems all at once? I need all of them right now. Is that still the case? And so, that so Wilson was asking about the list of every gem and all the gem specs, and um, currently the Marshall 4.4.8.z file will be staying around for the foreseeable future. It's pretty expensive to generate, so I believe it's only generated <coughs> once a day. Shane. Where do we go to help? So Shane asked, where do we go to help? Um, RubyGems is on GitHub now. Um, actually, I've got RubyGems. Here we go. I've prepared. Here's where you go to help. In the back. Are there any uh, features planned for the near future? Is it all just kind of trying to make it uh, more better? So are there any features planned for the future? Well, so my talk was about the history, so I didn't go over many of those other than my to-do items. Um, for RDoc, I've got, I've got a release almost ready to go. I'm trying to figure out the how to make um, command line options work better. For RubyGems, we're looking at um, making arbitrary uh, metadata for the gem specs, but I'm kind of nervous about that because of the potential for abuse. So we've got a couple things planned, uh, but not not so much for RubyGems. Yes? I just wanted to say thanks. Uh, our document for the gems were really bad shape. Well, you're welcome. Any comments on yard? <gasps> Any comments on yard? Um, Not yard, yard. Yard? Competitor to root. Yard. Yes, sorry, yard. Um, <coughs> for whatever reason, the yard maintainer has never spoken to me about much of anything. So I haven't really looked at Yard much either. Um, I do know it uses Ripper, so I may go and look at it to see how it uses Ripper to see what it does. Um, I think that most of what Yard could be done, Yard does, could be added as an extension to to, to RDoc, and I don't see any reason for um, for me to, to not want to do that. Um, but as to why he hasn't asked me before that, I'm not sure. I don't want to add I don't want to add those features to RDoc because. They're not my preferred style, and I don't want to have to make it. It's hard to maintain something that's not your passion. 
Neil Moore. All right, I believe that's it. Thank you.